I want to call your attention to something. After I finished my whining and spoke to him last week, I found a great soporific. And that great soporific is what we're debating, the NCN, NCCN guidelines, version two and version four, 2019 prostate cancer. Let me tell you, there are things that'll put you to sleep in a hurry. But if none of you have ever read one of these guideline papers, read it. Sleep comes. The interesting thing to me, though, in this guideline, reading it through and through, thanks to David, the fact remains that they offer references right in the guideline, instead of going to the end with 175 references where you can't remember what the topic was by the time you get to the reference. So I wanted to tell you this was the reference. The name of the game with screening, please, is to discover the asymptomatic patient with aggressive prostate cancer that has a potential for metastatic disease and death. But who's responsible for this whole thing? Who's responsible for the USPS Services Task Force? The urologist. Who did the radical prostatectomy that offered a surgical specimen? The radiation oncologist? The brachytherapist? The focal therapist? The ultrasound therapist? Don't be ridiculous. The only one who created this problem is the urologist who did a radical prostatectomy and sent the specimen to pathology. And that's where we came with overdiagnosis, overtreatment, because nobody else had the data. So please, David was the first one to recognize the potential of the USPS task force opportunity of attacking PSA and taking advantage of it. So please remember, the urologists, those of you sitting in the audience, you caused the problem which is leading to the greatest change in prostate cancer. Now in screening in 2019, uh, the diagnosis, the baseline evaluation, the biopsy indication, the management of the biopsy, the age for initiation of therapy, frequency of testing, and the age to discontinue testing. Those are all controversial. And when you read my soporific, you'll find out that uh, we don't have answers, we have suggestions. So the baseline evaluation, this idea of eliminating the digital rectal exam is ridiculous. I've had several people, when I was a Neolithic uh, ages, doing the uh, age-specific PSA for the area around the uh, VA in Denver, where I had some responsibility for Montana, Wyoming, North, South Dakota, Colorado, and uh, Utah. I followed the age-specific stuff that he published in 1992, only to be roundly criticized everywhere. But it worked. But the baseline evaluation, I also had a bunch of people who had normal PSAs based on those levels, who had abnormal digital rectal exams, and we did radical prostatectomies on them. And, uh, you know, they all had, I had uh, a group of Gleason 6 patients who underwent radicals, a group of two 4.3s and 3.4, eight 4.3 and 3.4s are one who went radicals, and I did two Gleason 8s, and the only indication was the abnormal rectal exam. Now, the two most common rectal examinations done at the uh, University of Colorado, not by urology, but by everybody else, are deferred and incompetent. <laughs> so you've got to be very careful about that. The biopsy indications, I think, you have to go for a PSA, and remember, PSA is the liquefaction factor in the male ejaculate. As you recall, the male ejaculate, when it's deposited in the vagina, is alkaline, and the sperm are extremely sensitive to an acid environment. And if you don't do something about that acid environment, there's not gonna be any future race. So you have to be very careful about the PSA, which is the, the detection of the liquefaction factor in the male ejaculate. A lot of people forget that. And of course, it came about in 1967, and there are permutations and combinations on top of all that. But the name of the game is the combination for screening, in my humble opinion, is the competent PSA and the competent digital rectal exam. Now, the one thing you can't do is compare PSAs done at five different hospitals in your town, because they all do different assays and everything. Management, of course, with the abnormality, is the biopsy. And the big controversy at the present time is what antibiotic or antibiotics to use. With, uh, with the quinolones being given out like water, 
you've got to be very careful about the quinolones, and the adding of genomycin to some other agent does help you. The age for initiation of testing. I'm very interested in that. My family, as you know, we adopted, my wife and I adopted two children from Chile, so my son is Hispanic. And my grandson is half Afro-American. So now I'm interested in what do we do with Hispanics and what do we do with Afro-Americans? And it's very controversial, and when you read the soporific here, it doesn't give you a good answer, it gives you suggestions. It suggests that Afro-Americans be studied from age 40 on, Hispanics from 45 on. But the most important thing, I think, is they finally recognize something in the family history. I've always thought it was very significant to find out, did someone die of prostate cancer in your family, or do they have prostate cancer in your family? The Gleason 6, that's not going to be a threat, that we discovered ourselves by performing our radical prostatectomies. So the age for initiation of testing has always been very controversial. And I concur with their comments here in Afro-Americans beginning at age 40, and in Hispanics beginning maybe at 40, 45, Caucasians maybe 45 or 50. The frequency of the testing, I think the most important thing about the frequency of testing is get the patient used to coming back. So do it each year. They don't forget it. The age discontinued testing, they say over 70, or in selected people who have less than a 10-year life expectancy. You try and discuss your less than 10-year life expectancy with your average patient <laughs> over the age of uh, 70, and you're going to spend the rest of your life steeped in BS. So you want to be careful. Screening the high-risk populations, we've already discussed that. The people with the Afro-American racial background and the BRCA1, BRCA2. But please remember, the BRCA1 is most significant for ovarian and breast cancer. It's the BRCA2 that is significant for prostate cancer and in male. And the genetic syndromes are very, very important. With regard to MRI, if we're trying to make an expensive test, do an MRI and see how expensive your study all of a sudden becomes. The PHI, the four score, and the confirm NDX are all mentioned in the soporific here as possible markers. I called Scott Lucia the other day and I said, marker. He said, there's only one marker, the select MDX. Dr. Shannon, how much is that going to set me back in MDX? Okay, so it's a $500 test. You have to be aware of that. So, what biopsy technique? 12 core, targeted, MRI or ultrasound guided, saturation biopsy, take your poison. It was quite interesting to me in active surveillance, which David attacked earlier today. Uh, when are you supposed to do the active surveillance uh, first study? And the answer from Toronto is in two years. The answer from uh, Johns Hopkins is at one year. What was the answer at Memorial Sloan Kettering? I was sitting in the audience when the great minds, the scientific minds, came up with what is the answer? Well, if Hopkins says one year and uh, Toronto says two, we'll select 18 months. And then they said, what, is, what does Crawford recommend? And I said, Crawford recommends the saturation transperineal biopsies. And then we don't have to do a repeat biopsy. And that was also very interesting. So the PSA of 1.5 came about, and uh, David just discussed the background for all of that. So I'll skip it. But remember, it's got to be associated with a rectal examination. And an asymmetric, nodular, or hard prostate is a significant problem. PSA less than 1.5, PSA more than 1.5. The biomarker we've already discussed. And the bell is ringing, so we've got to move on. So at the present time, I concur with Dr. Crawford for screening PSA less than 1.5 or PSA of more than 1.5. A rectal exam with the comments. The PSA of 1.5 or less, I think, falls out if the prostate itself is abnormal. And you don't defer the rectal exam. And then last but not least, please remember the absent prostate. It's very interesting to get a resident in the room and ask him for the size and symmetry of the prostate. And he gives you a size and symmetry you only know because the patient's had a previous radical prostatectomy. Even in Dr. Crawford's radical prostatectomies, there's no persisting prostate. So Scott Lucia on Monday, when I told him I was debating and needed some help, he said, screen smartly. 
At the present time, the PSA is done. A PSA of more than four is the indication for biopsy. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, don't give me that. Who's telling you that? He said, well, it's not the urologists. It's the pathologist who's reading the biopsies. Ugh. And the aim of screening detect aggressive cancer, life-threatening cancers. How many of the cancers at the VA are aggressive or life-threatening? Since 2000 and, uh, since 1990, I've been keeping record of all the biopsies done until I retired. And 43% of our biopsies are Gleason 3 plus 4, 4 plus 3, or above. That's careful. So, multiple biomarkers are available. Scott Lucia the other day said, forget this. Just do the select MDX, $500. It's non-invasive, it's a urine study, it does three genes. The most important thing is the negative predictive value, as several speakers have said so far, for aggressive cancer. So let's go, PSA less than 1.5, more than 1.5. DRE, normal or abnormal. Uh, do the biomarker. If the biomarker is negative, return. And no one knows for sure what the right answer is to want to have them back. So you do what makes the patient come back to you. And then I think, in my opinion, make it every year. If the biopsy is abnormal, if the biomarker is abnormal, do a biopsy. So I don't follow any of the recommendations from the soporific. Thank you for your attention.